I want to start with a central term um, that is both essential to your work. Uh, it is in the title of your work, if anyone can guess what it is. And it's also central to, Bo to Beauvoir's work. Um, and it's this term becoming. And in particular, you're interested in the relationship between being and becoming. And this is a relationship that has a pretty weighty philosophical history. Uh, and it's adopted in a very particular fashion by Beauvoir and by yourself. So can you tell us what you understand by this term becoming and how Beauvoir used it in her text to formulate her very famous phrase that one is not born a woman, but becomes one? Okay, so if we start with Plato, we're gonna be here a long time. <laughs> um, uh, the, so, being and becoming, it, as you say, has a long history in philosophy, but I do want to start with Plato just briefly, because um, Plato was a philosopher who denigrated becoming and the, ch the, the, the world of the material and changing, uh, the world of being embodied, uh, of existing in, in time. And um, existentialists are famous for saying that existence precedes essence. Um, so we're moving quite a long way from Plato now, um, but th this is important to, to Beauvoir's philosophy because she thinks that you don't have, there's no blueprint for any human life. Um, you have just a series of, of choices that unfold before you and you become, and life is a perpetual becoming. And I really appreciate Beauvoir as a philosopher of time and I see her as inheriting uh, some of her thinking about time from Henri Bergson. Uh, and he in particular had a view of time, which uh, I think is really beautiful. Instead of just seeing it as a line, uh, uh, some sort of linear conception of time, uh, he, he thought of it as the, 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 ex the human experience of time is more like uh, a cone. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a bit about music and then I'll come back to this cone. <laughs> Uh, when you hear a piece of music that has a repeated uh, refrain or phrase, like if you think about a Baroque piece of music like Vivaldi's Spring, the first time you hear the notes of this piece of music, it's different from the subsequent time because the repetition changes the quality of the first time. And in Bergson's theory of time, uh, you don't start with a one point T1 and then move to T2 and T3 then in all these distinct instants. He says it's more like a cone because the memory of the past instance uh, informs each subsequent instant. Just like hearing the same phrase from Vivaldi is different the second time or the third time. And I think one of the things that Beauvoir is very fascinated with in, in her works is, is the subjective experience of time from a first person point of view, um, what it means to remember as a person or as a society. And uh, so becoming was very important to me because uh, we don't know who, who we're going to become in advance. She did not know that she was going to be this, uh, this figure, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, for most of her life. <laughs> Later on, she had to live with being that figure and she had to become a public figure in, in multiple different senses over the course of her life. Um, but that's why I wanted to make becoming central. And so you talk um, in your work, you talk about this notion she has of the possibles, mm -hmm. um, the possibilities for her life. And you write that uh, she realized that her future hold many possibilities. She called them her possibles in French. And that bit by bit, she would have to kill all but one of them so that on the last day of her life, there would be one reality. She would have lived one life. And you write that the question was, which life? So can you expand upon this notion of possibles and tell us how it relates to the concept of freedom that she developed over the course of her life? Yes, so this, co this conception of subjective possibilities or uh, possibles in the plural um, is something that you find in her Cahier de Jeunesse, in her, in her student notebooks. It's also something that you find in the philosophy of Sartre and in his 1940s works on the imagination. Uh, he talks about in fact, at the, the conclusion of the imagination, he says, what must, uh, what must consciousness be in order to imagine? It must be free. And so for her, the, 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 the combination of uh, freedom and ima imagination is a really, it's a really, it's a really rich one. Um, 
and both she and Sartre discuss this idea that each human being has a, a range of subjective possibilities. Um, but I think what Beauvoir paid more attention to, in my opinion, is the way that those possibilities are constrained by social expectations. Um, and because you, you might think that pursuing certain possibilities for yourself will result in punishment, not necessarily literal, but um, so, sort of social penalties if you fail to conform to the imaginary that has been prescribed to you by your milieu. So. And this relates to another concept that's pretty central to her work, which is that of situation. Can you explain what the sp specific term situation means for Beauvoir? Yes, so I'm going to have to bring in a little bit more existentialist jargon, um, but th th so <laughs> um, so situation is a concept that you find in many philosophers of the second quarter of the 20th century. So you find it in Gabriel Marcel, you find it in Sartre, you find it in Merleau-Ponty, and in Beauvoir. And um, so one of the concepts that's famous uh, in, in existentialism and outside of it, uh, which Sartre discusses at length in Being in Nothingness is bad faith. Uh, and he says that bad faith is to over-identify with one pole of your existence. So your freedom on the one hand is a pole of your existence and your facticity is the other. So your freedom is your ability to transcend. Um, to Can you explain what facticity means very quickly yes. as well? <laughs> I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, don't worry, I'll do we'll both of them. Deeper deeper I'll do the both hole. of them and then we'll come out as a whole. So, so the facticity is all of the contingent and unchosen things about you, like where you were born. Uh, like it comes from the word fact. It it's comes from the word life. fact, yes. Yeah. Uh, but they, these are things you have not chosen. They are uh, place and family of your birth, uh, the means of your family, the color of your skin, your sex, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and so because the existentialists were so keen on this concept of becoming and not having a blueprint, blueprint and not being determined, um, they needed to take into account the fact that many of us are not pure unconstrained freedoms. Uh, we are actually limited by the circumstances into which we are born in various ways. But bad faith consists in either failing to acknowledge the limitations of your situation to bring it back to situation, or failing to acknowledge that you are free in your situation, whatever your situation may be. So Beauvoir's conception of situation is, uh, it's, inc it's incredibly important because she thinks that you can't really understand human freedom without understanding that each individual person is in a particular situation which places limitations on their freedom. Um, Yes, I'll stop there. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. So it seems like we've arrived back at the two terms that we started with that are kind of seem to be on opposite poles, which is one is being and one is becoming. And it seems to me that facticity is more of the order of being. It's what's kind of static and fixed and stable. And then um, on the other side, we have freedom, which is this uh, acting out one's possibilities, seeking to transform one's situation that one's in. And so for the existentialists and for Beauvoir, it's about navigating a balance between the two, recognizing that one both is kind of confined to the situation of being, but also able to act within. Yeah, so I think, I think that um, th there's a lot we could say about Beauvoir and being, um, but <laughs> I think that with, 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 with facticity, with, with, with facticity, she would say that you're always free to decide what to make of your, fa of the, of your facticity. So even if you say that it's being, that can make it sound fixed in a way th that I think she might want to push back on a little bit. Um, the, me the meaning of your past is always open to re renegotiation. And that's part of why becoming is, an, is, is not a process that stops while you're alive. Uh, because y you can continue to think about the meaning of your life. You continue to encounter people who will say that your life means different things to what you think it means. And so it's an ongoing negotiation. Yeah. I want to turn to the second sex um, and to the concepts of womanhood that are at play there. And I want to turn to you, Nahim, because I know that you've studied the second sex, the second sex um, very intensely, very in-depth. So when we're looking at this notion of situation um, that Kate has been describing for us and this idea of um, 
navigating the, the, li the limits of one's freedoms within the sphere of facticity. Um, how does this bring us to womanhood? In what ways could we see womanhood as a situation? And what does de Beauvoir tell us we can do about this? <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a big question for me as a historian, because I, as um, you said, I'm not a, um, a philosopher. But um, uh, maybe I, ca I can answer from my um, experience as a historian who has studied the, the, the letters, maybe, and from my own experience of um, those letters, and also as a reader, um, an ordinary reader, a woman who read The Second Sex. And uh, um, I think that's uh, what is very powerful with uh, the second sex and Beauvoir's philosophy that Kate um, just explained uh, with uh, about situation and um, is that uh, the notion of becoming, like you said, and uh, what I read on the letters and what I felt as a reader is uh, the uh, the infinite possibilities that this uh, concept of becoming offers. Um, because, uh, I mean, it, there is not one way to be a, a woman. That's this philosophy uh, just um, um, shows. And uh, there are many possibilities um, of, of becoming. So, uh, yes, I think that's what is very powerful. And that's also why uh, many women wrote to her. And also why I think we are still attached to uh, Bovo's work and especially the second sex. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that answers the question very well, but from my experience as a historian who studied the letters and as a, an ordinary woman and not as a philosopher, that's what I would say um, about um, womanhood and the philosophy of Simone de Beauvoir. It's interesting that you're establishing this distinction between yourself as a historian and what you see as being a philosopher, what do you what do you mean by this distinction? The distinction between a philosopher and a historian. Yeah, in, um, in what ways is is the work that you do not philosophy? Why is it history instead? Maybe it, it's uh, that I work from um, maybe the reception, not from the text. I mean, the text of the the second sex as a text is not secondary to my work, but is it's not the, the the central at the center of my work my work is focused on how the second sex was read and uh, um how it was received and appropriated by women and so the text i maybe i have more personal attachment to the text uh, I, I'm not reading it as a, as a historian I'm not studying it as a historian but I'm focused on what is um, maybe the materiality of the text, what's around the text, the context and uh, um, the reception, like the public reception, the ordinary reception, but not the text itself. So maybe that's it. But on the other hand, I, I'm just speaking about maybe there are historians working on the text, but I'm, I'm thinking about historian, American historian Judith Coffin, um, and I would define her and, and me as cultural historian. Um, and so, yes, working with the text, but not, um, not well, y you know what I mean, the materiality of the text and not the text itself. So but, but maybe you have a, a something to say about being a philosopher. <laughs> no. no. And, and we work. Well, I mean, Kate, <laughs> do, you, do you agree with this distinction between engaging with the text from a historical perspective and a philosophical perspective because i think what you're saying is is also that you're engaging with it personally and on a personal level but for Beauvoir philosophy was personal in the way that one reads text for me seems like a it requires personal engagement so how do we distinguish these and i i i, I just want to ask uh, to add that i cultural historian yes that's what i said but for example, with my doctoral research, I tried to engage with the text from also from a phenomenological perspective. And so I would say that I'm also trying to develop a phenomenological approach to history. And of course, that implies to have and to work with this personal attachment to the text. Um, this is, yeah. 
Well, this is great because this brings us to another philosophical term that I've been wanting us to define. So we're just going to add to our little dictionary that we're building tonight. Can you explain to us what phenomenology I is? Razzle <laughs> Uh, maybe Kate will explain it. Well, we've got lots of time. You can both do I it. Can, <laughs> yes, I can explain how I uh, like my perspective from history and uh, how I work uh, as a historian with phenomenology. But maybe the concept, maybe Kate will All explain. Right, well, we'll start with Kate. Yeah, Kate's going to give I us super quick, just like she just ran us through Plato. She's going to do really fast phenomenology and then we'll move. Okay. Um, so, so. I'll do a, a, a very short sentence, a few sentences of history. The, the, so Kant, Immanuel Kant, uh, distinguished between uh, the realm of the phenomenal and the realm of the noumenal. So the phenomenal being the things as they appear to us uh, and, and the noumenal being things in themselves. And Kant thought that you couldn't know things in themselves. You could only know things as they appear to us. Well, this is a sort of contest contestable way of putting it. Um, but the... Um, Phenomenologists, starting in the 19th century with the works of Edmund Husserl, uh, said that, that we could have a science, a rigorous science of the phenomena that appear to us. And this rigorous science uh, included phenomenological description, among other things. And so what phenomenological description is, uh, is a matter of debate among philosophers. But in the, uh, in the 1940s, well, actually in, in the tw 20s and 30s, as well. Uh, this generation of French philosophers, Sartre, Meloponty, Beauvoir, Levinas, uh, and, and many others were interested in phenomenology because it took people away from abstraction towards the concrete. Uh, it took them to, the, to, to life as life is lived. Uh, and because you could, uh, you could do philosophy about, as one famous story goes, an apricot cocktail. You could do philosophy about. Can you explain the apricot cocktail? The to apricot us? cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this, so Raymond Daron came back from Germany and had a drink. Okay. <laughs> came back from Germany, uh, talking about phenomenology. Uh, and he and Sartre were drinking apricot cocktails, and this was supposed to be a moment of epiphany um, that that you could do philosophy ab about something about something like a cocktail. Um, what does it mean to do philosophy about a cocktail? Well, to describe it, I think. To describe, I mean, what, what do you think it means to do philosophy about a cocktail? I know you're a philosopher yourself. So. Well, I don't know. It's a challenging question. I yeah. mean, are you studying? And I think this also brings us to the question of the type of philosophy that Beauvoir was doing. Yeah whether she was doing it through literature, whether she was doing it through memoirs, yep. through diaries. Um, so description, it seems, is a philosophical activity in itself. Is yes. that what we mean by phenomenology? And so by studying these objects and the way they appear to us, we can arrive at understandings of our own consciousness and the way our own consciousness works. Yes, yes, so I think so. I think the... Um, so I think that the part of the reason that description matters as a phenomenological method is b because it's supposed to give you a way at getting at the truth, um, which is a, a, a different method. And uh, a colleague of mine, Catherine Morris, I think has a really good way of, of, of articulating this. She says that a, a, a cri the criterion of correctness for phenomenology is that when you hear a phenomenological description and it resounds with your experience, then you think, oh, that's true. So perhaps you've had this experience of a friend describing to you an emotion and you've never heard it described that way, but it unlocks a way of looking at the feeling, which you think, oh, that's true. And it helps you articulate. Um, it, it might help you articulate uh, uh, an experience, a phenomenon that you've had before. Um, I think that in as Beauvoir is employing the method, she is, well, the, 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 I think she employs other phenomenological methods as well, but um, she's trying to get people to uh, to listen to their own experience. And, and that's why lived experience is such a central feature of the second sex. It's yeah. That's the kind of subject of the entire second volume of the work. So she's describing experience from the body, of yeah. from being inside the body of a woman, um, yeah. which is a contested concept today, but at her yeah. time, this was quite a radical project to undertake. Um, and she's describing the psychological processes that women undergo when they are raised in particular cultures and societies. Um, Marina, I want to return to you and talk about 
how Simone de Beauvoir um, expressed or used personal experience in her works and then what the response was that you've discovered in the letters that people wrote to her, how this experience spoke to the experiences of the women who were reading this text. Yeah, um, I was uh, I was gonna say, just to, to, to um, talk a little bit more about phenomenology, just the, that, that correspondence is part of the of Beauvoir's um, philosophical project. And I think she, well, I, I don't know what you think about that, but um, I, I think that she used the letters as a phenomenological laboratory. I mean, like she used uh, them to observe the lived experience. I mean, the letters are the a, a, a sort of manifestation of lived um, experiences. Do you mean letters from her readers or letters from her between readers. her yeah, friends? No. Yes, from her readers. Um, I um, yeah, from the from the readers, B and and uh, it helped her shape and then qualify her um, way to see women's lives and to analyze women's life lives. So uh, yes, I think the correspondence of the readers and especially from uh, from women. Uh, is essential in understanding Beauvoir's philosophical project, and uh, and they're very interesting because um, um, those are all letters uh, that that they are very moving. Um, women uh, confide in Simone de Beauvoir their very uh, their sorrows. I mean, their everyday uh, life is a sorrow. So yes, uh, I think it was very. Um, important to her to be close to her readership in order to um, access uh, women's lives. So, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit more about your project because it's absolutely fascinating. It's really, really wonderful. Um, so you, you have been studying the archive of letters that were sent to Beauvoir after the publication of the different texts. You've studied, if my numbers are correct, over 20,000 letters. And in particular, you're studying the, the lectrices, so the, the female readers um, who are responding to this, um, and they're responding to different texts across Beauvoir's career. So she wrote The Second Sex, but she was also a novelist. She also published her memoirs. Um, and you've uncovered a change in the gender of the readers or of those writing to her across the different texts that she's reading. So particularly, tell us about the women that are reading Beauvoir. What is their economic background? Are they from Paris? Are they from the same milieu that she grew up in? What are they saying to her? Um, are they positive or are they negative in their response to her? Or did you find a mixed, a mixed batch of both? Um, yes, just just I, I want to first uh, put those letters in context. Um, Beauvoir received yes around thousand to twenty thousand letters uh, during her career, uh, and those letters are kept at the French National Library, à la BNF, in Paris since 1995 when her adopted daughter Sylvie Lebon de Beauvoir gave uh, the letters to, to the French National Library. So it's a huge collection. Um, and um, wh what I was interested in um, in those letters, it, well, I focus on uh, the letters written by women because they are uh, the majority uh, to write to Beauvoir. So they um, they started to write. I mean, the collection starts in around 1949, uh, around the publication of the Second Sex. But it doesn't mean that she uh, did not receive any letter before, because she started her literary career in 1943 with Lindy T. Four, I, I I can't remember, but yeah. And uh, um, there are not many letters from women uh, when the second sex appeared. It was a, a scandal in France. It was um, a very conservative atmosphere uh, due to the end of the uh, Second World War and uh, also um, the Cold War. So maybe um, women didn't uh, write um, about it because it was um, it, it, it was considered inappropriate to discuss women's lives and sexuality because there are many chapters on sexuality in um, in the second sex and it, it, it was a, a shock uh, to the readers from um, uh, that perspective but um the the it doesn't mean that it wasn't it wasn't read it was read but they waited until the publication of the memoirs and especially 
um, memoir of a dutiful daughter is that the the, the english um it's the first memoir it's the, the first volume the of the memoir yes. describes her childhood mm -hmm. and adolescence yes and it appeared in 1958 and from that moment uh women started to send uh letters um massively and um and so yeah that that's the moment where they began to, to so write. why do you think it was the memoir that kind of opened this channel up that made women think oh this is someone that i can write to that i can confide in as opposed to second sex what's the difference mm -hmm. there um i think it's what you said before and what we we are discussing t uh, tonight it's uh the personal aspect and the biographical as aspect because it made Bo Beauvoir much more uh, well closer to her um, female readers and also men readers, but especially women readers because they could. Um, um, I, I remember a letter where uh, a, a female reader wrote that she felt like she was a Susie. So I don't have the the friend the 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 English translation. No, a Susie. I'm afraid I can't translate okay. that. Does anyone in the audience? Yeah, like a Susie, yes, a twin, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, thank you. So yeah, that that she, she that they were the same, in fact. Okay, so it, it, so they, they saw Simone de Beauvoir as a sort of double or someone yeah. they identified mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. even though their situations were not the same. So that's bring that brings me to the um, your question about um, from what social background those uh, women wrote and there's this old um criticism that Beauvoir uh, wrote a very bourgeois work especially the second sex and that she wrote um a bourgeois work because she was um a bourgeois herself even though she criticized this um um her origin and her um social class um and I I realized that there were a lot of women from this social background in the letters, but uh, again I think it, it it needs to be contextualized because writing a letter to a writer is very part of um, the the mass culture and the celebrity culture, and during the glorious thirty, uh, the mass culture is. Um, um, it is very bourgeois or it, it it creates what we call or what um, American Christian Rose call the new middle class, la nouvelle, nouvelle classe sociale. And so um, it, the, the, the audience of mass culture is precisely the white, um, uh, heterosexual, bourgeois, um, married, um, happily married woman. Et and this is at the time of the Beauvoir's writing or is this still true today? Uh, no, uh, I'm speaking of the, of um, the time when okay. Beauvoir was yeah. writing Jury the Glorious Thirty and uh, the Glorious, so that we're 50s, writing. 60s, and uh, until 75, 1975, and so the 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 so the practice to writing a letter to a writer um, stems from mass culture. So it's it's um, like normal to find in the letters uh, women with this social background. But it doesn't mean there are not other uh, characteristics or other women. And um, and they really need to be, their letters need to be explored much better. Uh, and they're waiting at the BNF, the National Bank, to be um, studied. But yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. that's great. And so Kate, um, we have arrived at this point where we're discussing how the biographical aspect of Beauvoir's memoirs is what really opened her up as this figure who could be seized as a kind of celebrity object almost with, with whom women could identify and write to, uh, made her into the sort of celebrity iconic figure that she is today. This obviously creates a massive challenge for you as her biographer to contend with the fact that this woman who wrote kind of so insistently against the mythologization of women has become a bit of a myth in herself. Um, so what are the stakes of writing Simone de Beauvoir's biography in your terms? Well, I said at the introduction that it was terrifying. Um, <laughs> it's a good start, it, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, she, she left so many millions of words uh, for, for us to, to read, uh, not not just the philosophical works and the and the, the novels and and the memoirs. 
uh, but also the letters uh, that, that Maureen works on and letters to many other beloved people. Um, so that just in sheer um, volume terms, it's a terrifying project. But I think I also found it uh, sort of troubling from an ethical point of view, because when you're writing about another human life, um, that is, it's a delicate thing to do. <laughs> and if you read about biographers writing about biographies, there are all kinds of metaphors that biographers use to describe this. So one is the kind of forensic metaphor of the autopsy, uh, that you're sifting through everything, trying to get to grips with the what happened in the life. Which implies that you're kind of looking at this dead body, right? You're not yes. looking at a living no, it, it, exactly. entity, but a, but a corpse, a corpse. Like on a table that you're cutting yep. into. Yep. Not to be too vivid. <laughs> Yeah, so there's the autopsy metaphor, another that is uh, often used, which I prefer uh, for for reasons you might be able to imagine, is uh, the portrait, um, because what you're trying to go for in, in a biography is a likeness, um, not an exact scientific record of um, what's happened to the body in question. Um, and I, I think the um, in, in particular with Beauvoir's life, the feminist politics are challenging because uh, she is, uh, she's often cited as a figure sort of at a Torah term, so to, as an authority, uh, you get people, feminists of different stripes say, saying, well, Beauvoir says, uh, as though this means we should believe it. Um, but Beauvoir herself, uh, because she was a philosopher of freedom, didn't think that anyone should be adopting points of views because they are imposed on them from without. And she would have rejected this kind of argument to authority, I think, uh, in an uh, because she believed that her role as a writer and as a feminist was it to appeal to the freedom of others. Um, so I think, uh, I'm not sure I want to write a biography again. <laughs> um, <One's> enough. <laughs> uh, but because it did involve wrestling with these questions, it involves uh, cultivating an intimacy with another person's life, which feels quite uncomfortable at times. And I think that's one of the things that's fascinating about um, your comments, Maureen, in terms of uh, the memoirs, because I think that previously, from, from what I remember of the letters that I've read that you've worked on, um, many of these women saw Beauvoir as a distant figure who talked about these abstract uh, concepts in philosophy and used words like phenomenology and facticity and so forth. But when they read the memoirs of a dutiful daughter, suddenly they encountered um, a little girl who had loved the particular patterns uh, or the particular fabrics of her dresses, um, a little girl who remembered her mother tucking her in before going back to dinner parties, and who could who could identify with this person, this this woman, uh, at least in some stages of her becoming. So th there was this new intimacy, I think, um, at, at at that period of her life, uh, which drew people close to her, but it also led to all kinds of projections, um, that, you know, in terms of. Uh, whether she lived up to the expectations they had of her and so forth. So. And she was maintaining so many different images of herself at the same time at this point, right? Because she had the self that she was constructing in her memoirs, which you've, you've demonstrated, both of you demonstrated, it wasn't necessarily truthful. There were things that she deliberately omitted. Could you talk about what she left out of the image she gave to the public and how it felt for you to uncover this other self and to to make it public knowledge? Was that challenging for you? So yes and no, it was and it wasn't. I mean, I think, so she she says in in her memoirs that she's not telling everything. This is not a tell-all. <laughs> and, and a memoir is, is a literary work. It's, it's, an, it's a narrative, which is a construction based on life. Um, um, anyway, there's interesting, interesting things about the genre that we could discuss, but uh, she, she left out several lovers who were not such, uh, which contributed to the widespread conception of their relationship uh, as being a lifelong romantic relationship. Um, and in actual fact, he was not central in her life from a traditional uh, amorous point of view from about a decade after their meeting each other. Is this a euphemistic way to say that they were not sexually together or yeah. what what do you mean he wasn't central to her life <laughs> we can just be open here I mean <laughs> I mean not I mean also that there were other people that she was sexually interested in and who I mean there's a there's a point in in the in in the student diaries where she says um 
very soon after meeting him, like within the first year, that, that he had come to occupy a very central place in her life. But it was neither um, in, uh, in her, th that centrality was not to her body or her heart because, quote, there many others could be, but he was the incomparable friend of her thought. So you have this, yes, it is beautiful. <laughs> she had a way with words. Um, <laughs> the, um, and I think that, that I, I wanted to show in the biography how important the relationship the bit with Sartre was to her, in part because she's critical of um, the many myths that she thinks contribute to the perpetuation of women's uh, subordination. And one of those is the kind of the romantic myth that that an, a love a lover is going to have is going to be the most central person in your life a sexual lover in actual fact she was very interested in many forms of human love in intellectual friendship and different kinds of friendship and supporting feminists and solidarity in her later life and and so i wanted just to, to, to kind of to show that um this erotic plot is is wrong and in fact that her philosophy has some interesting things to say about why it's so persistent. And I really want to return to this question of the centrality of love to her philosophy and ethics, um, because it's, I think it separates her slightly from the other existentialist projects that she has this kind of question of love that continues to occur to her at different moments of time and that she expresses through different mediums. Um, but before we return to that, I wanna jump back to you, Maheen, and talk more about this idea that um, she became more accessible through the memoir writing and that women saw her as someone that they could speak to, confide in. Um, and I know you've brought some excerpts from the letters with us. Could you read us the first one where she talks about, she talks about the study of descending from the pedestal? Yes, so it's a letter from um, a female reader, of course, from 1959. And uh, uh, she writes, um, after your memoirs, you came down from a pedestal in a good way you became more human and your cultural and intellectual superiority doesn't make you distant anymore. So that's a very short excerpt, but it's mm. very uh, powerful. Like it, it, it shows how she, yeah, she m offered her life to her audience. And so uh, they, they were very um, uh, glad she did. And I have another one if you like, yes, yes. okay. Uh, so it's another letter from the same year, 1959. And it begins uh, like this, Madam, I confess that this title at the beginning of my letter seems unusual. I've just reread your book and I suddenly thought that no one more than you would be ready to hear me talk about it. It seemed to me during these pages to be so close to you, to share your thoughts as well as your days, that this Madam seems strange to me. So they, they really see uh, saw her as uh, their friend. I mean, their friend, their sister, their um, confidant. Is that an English word? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, she, she it, it was, and she replied to uh, those letters and uh, she, she did more than replying. She, um, she invited uh, her readers to write and to, to, to give some news, to, to confide in her over the years. So there are, uh, letters that are part of um, uh, long time correspondences. I mean, they are. And it seems to me that the fact that she took such an interest in responding to her readers, um, showing an interest in their lives, offering them help or guidance in some way, this plays into the larger ethical question at the center of her philosophy, which is how to act in good ways and in ways which are demonstrative of responsibility towards the others um, that are around us. Uh, and so I want us to end, maybe you disagree with that, do you wanna respond? <laughs> uh, no, but, but and on the other hand, there's mm -hmm. another ethical problem is it's that the fact that she kept the letters and now we're in 2023 and I am studying those letters and those readers, those correspondents didn't expect a young historian to study their letters because those letters were addressed uh, to Beauvoir and to and only to her, and so uh, the the ethical problem is transferred to me now, and uh, I, I need to deal with it, and it's very complicated for me to do so. And how do you deal with it? 
and that's th th that um i i i developed what i call the uh, phenomenological approach to history that because it allows me to put myself into my research and to create uh, what Beauvoir or Beauvoirian calls an asymmetrical reciprocity. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it means that, for example, uh, between Beauvoir and uh, a female reader who writes to her, there is an asymmetry. Like it's she's a famous uh, writer, and the one that the female who wrote writes a letter is an anonymous, an anonymous, an anonymous sorry, woman. So an ordinary woman. Okay. And so uh, Beauvoir has to reconcile this uh, gap uh, by creating um, a reciprocity. And how uh, does she do that? Well, she invites um, her um, uh, correspondents to confide, to write. She tries to uh, meet with them. She, she creates an environment where it is possible for these women to feel listened to by this uh, famous re um, writer. Now, what I what I'm trying to do is the same as Beauvoir, <laughs> meaning that um, I'm a historian, so I'm studying the letter. Uh, those letters are the objects of my research, and um, I'm. It, it is. Uh, it would be much clearer when I explain that I met with some of the correspondents, so they know that I'm working on on their letters. So I tried to communicate with them um, on a different scale um, um, than that of historical research. And it is phenomenological uh, because I'm, um, I'm creating a reciprocity by offering the, um, my life to them. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big word, but in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing my personal experiences with them because they gave me uh, um, their life in in a, in a sense, so it yes, it's this asymmetric reciprocity that I'm trying to work uh, around. So in the same yes, Kate. Well, I just wanted to share a little anecdote on this um, this subject because when I met Marine in 2018 at a conference at Paris Tête, and the person I, Marine was giving a paper on on these letters, and the person sitting next to me asked me in French if they could take a photo of my notes. And I thought this was a little strange. And so I asked why. And uh, she said it was because one of the, the, the writers that Marine was discussing was her mother. And so she was really moved to be there and hearing about this, her mother's part in history. So I just thought, um, yes, it's, it's beautiful to see that side of it. And in a way, this, this kind of maintains the tradition that de Beauvoir was founding by bringing lived personal experience to philosophy in the second sex. We are now bringing all of our own lived experiences to this text as we approach it. And we are in this way participating in this sort of chain of women who have read this text and responded to it in this embodied personal way. Um, and that constitutes serious philosophical work in itself. And that actually inserts itself into Beauvoir's philosophical project, um, which is something that you identify in your work as the project to vivre philosophiquement, to live philosophically. Can you explain to us just kind of a last question before we turn to our very patient audience? What do you mean by this term living philosophically? Well, so Beauvoir said that every living step is a philosophical choice. Um, and, and she was, I think, preoccupied with a question that many philosophers have been preoccupied with, uh, which is this experience that many humans have of a gap between um, who they are and who they think they should be. And the philosophical for life for Beauvoir, I think, involves acknowledging that gap. Um, but the, in the project of the second sex, I think she wanted women to say, look, so much of the gap between who, Sorry, she wanted women to realize that so much of the gap between who they were and who they should be was dependent on the imposition of ideals from without and the imposition in particular of ideals that were defined or th that defined women uh, in relation to men's needs and desires instead of in relation to their own values. So when she said 
that she wanted to encourage people to live philosophically. I think she means it in that sort of traditional sense that the reflective life is 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 worth living. <laughs> And moreover, that the reflective life can release you from ideals that you don't, in fact, endorse about who you might become. Can we have a big round of applause, please? We're now going to open the discussion up to questions. Uh, so we'll start with our audience here in the room, and then we will move on to our Zoom audience. And we have someone who's very eager, who has her hand raised already. Uh, so Alfonso will bring you the mic. Uh, yes, I've, I've been very interested by what you've been saying, but I still, I have a question in my mind. Um, it just happened by a series of coincidences. Uh, that my interest was um, uh, went on a question, which is uh, how Beauvoir behaved when she was a professor at Lycée Molière, um, engaging in uh, homosexual relations with girls, and then sometimes passing on these girls to Sartre. Um, you know. I understand about their concept of freedom, but at the time, I guess, uh, there was not what we've seen and heard recently that in freedom, um, there is there can be a very large difference in power in age. Um, did she ever go back on these experiences? Uh, did she analyze them? Um, did she realize that she was hurting people? Uh, what did she think when Sartre uh, talked about Beauvoir's harem, uh, you know, all these girls around Beauvoir? Uh, what did they think when she was forbidden to teach, which is not very well known, but she was forbidden to teach. Uh, um, Education Nationale um, set her back in her position in 1945. Um, I was um, interested. Uh, Sorry, I was interested in this because uh, my family, my husband's family knows very well the Lomblin family, you know. And so um, what what do you have? Did she ever come back on these experiences? What did she have to say about those? Or did she just forget them? So she did not forget them. And she did go back to them. And in letters to Sartre, she says, we harmed her. Uh, so, yes, so I, I mean, I refer readers to the, 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 the memoir of Bianca Lamblin, if you would like to read that. I think it's a really, um, it's a fascinating document because of the ambivalence that I think is in that text um, and it, it, towards both Sartre and Beauvoir, but not in the same way. Um, so she did express some regret, uh, whether or not that regret is adequate, uh, I will leave for you to judge for yourselves. Um, but what I think is interesting from a philosophical point of view is that she experiences that happened before she has this ex this kind of con conversion to ethics and and a conversion to taking her her, her freedom seriously as imposing responsibilities on her um, towards the freedoms of others. And so I think um, rather than seeing it as a kind of instance of hypocrisy, I see it as a, a at least possibly, um, a case of a human being changing uh, after having done things that did harm others. So. Yes, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned the philosophies of de Beauvoir and Sat. I think it would be interesting to know to what extent they were of one mind or where they might have diverged. And also, the question of facticity, we're all born into circumstances over which we have no control. Hers were favorable, I think, to her own enterprise. Her mother was Catholic, et cetera. Her father was, wasn't entirely at one with her. But um, in her work in The Second Sex, um, she's encouraging freedom. Through what is she, I suppose, her freedom might have been born from her great love of literature that would have freed her. Would she have been inciting her female readers to have found the same sort of freedom she did in various writers and whom they might have been?
Okay. So, um, okay. Uh, the literature, I think, for Beauvoir is a kind of crucible of possibility. When you read a text, uh, you you can you, you can see from the point of view of the narrator or the characters in in the text, um, you can see the way that a situation involves multiple possible directions. And so I think that reading for her, I mean, there, there's a wonderful essay called Literature and Metaphysics, which she wrote in the mid-1940s, where she says um, that there are different kinds of philosophers. There are systems philosophers like Spinoza and Leibniz, and there are subjectivity philosophers. And in that category, she puts Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky. And one of the things that Dostoevsky does beautifully is he writes novels that are famous for being polyphonic. They have multiple voices. They don't tell you what to do. They just say, here are some ways. And so I think in Beauvoir's literature, as I read it, she, she was trying to appeal to the freedoms of her readers um, rather than tell them how they should live. Um, and so I, I think in terms of the literature that she was recommending at different stages of her career, she, she was a, um, closely involved with Violette Le Duc. I don't know. Um, it, it, yeah, so Violette Le Duc. Who else was she? I'm trying to think who else she sort of mentored. You might be able to study. Mm, Clara Cerelli, uh, Florence Azzi. Uh, yeah, many, many French uh, writers. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. And um, I, I was just uh, trying to think of um, exchange with her readers through letters. And uh, um, in, in the 60s, I think she were very interested in sociology and uh, she uh, i found letters from beauvoir to her uh, readers and especially female readers and she recommends uh, a lot uh, to read sociological uh, work and i think um it's uh, also part I, I remember an interview um uh, of her, I, I can't remember the date, but she says that she wants her work to be more sociological. I don't know if you remember this interview, and I think it's interesting because uh, it she, she she wants to create literature as documentary, and it's what she she does uh, in Les Belles Images, Pretty Picture, which is a what she calls a a monography or a, a document on the bourgeois uh, society. Uh, Parisian society. So um, yes, um, I think she transformed her um, relationship to literature through sociology. And uh, it makes sense because uh, during the 60s, uh, sociology uh, is a very popular discipline in, in French universities. So um, yeah, uh, I, was, I was just trying to, maybe it's not relevant, but uh, that's what I thought about when you Thanks a lot. So I had a question for Marine. Like you mentioned at one point that like like some of those people who wrote letters to Simone were still with us. And I was just wondering like maybe what sort of, how would they reflect on the impact their correspondence with Simone had on their lives? Merci. We, oui, uh, um, sorry, I have to think in French before I can talk in English. Yeah, that's a very tough exercise for me. So yes, uh, actually, I was with one of them this afternoon, and it was a lovely afternoon for me because uh, we developed very close ties. Um, uh, it's she always it's she's called Colette, for example, Colette Avran, um, and uh, she always talk uh, talks to me about Beauvoir and how she um, Beauvoir um, influenced her and. It, it, she is still influencing her today in her life. I mean, she reflects uh, on their relationship, their past relationship. So they met a lot in in real life. 
um, and uh, uh, how it, yeah, um, so I'm, I'm gonna say more, I think, about uh, uh, Colette's life. She was a teenager in the 60s when she started to write to uh, Beauvoir, and she was struggling with two things, um, the, the, her family and the, the, the fact that she was a Jew, a Jewish? A Jewish, a Jew, okay, and uh, and uh, it was very complicated to make sense of the the past. The Shoah was very close um, during the sixties, so it was like a trauma, a trauma. And uh, the second uh, problem that she was facing was her sexuality, and uh, uh, she was uh, she discovered that she was a lesbian, and Beauvoir helped her uh, to embrace her sexuality. And today um, she is. Um, happily living with uh, uh, her lover, uh, her lover, a woman. Uh, she's been with her uh, for 20 years now. And she keep uh, saying that it, it is thanks to Beauvoir's help. Uh, her philosophy, her conversations um, help her to um, live an, uh, it's th th the word that she, she uses, an uh, authentic uh, life. So that's just one example, but there are many others like, uh, like Uh, I'm very bad in uh, English, so I'm sorry. Wait, it's okay. Uh, I just wanted to um, not respond, but to add something with the lady in blue, is that I, I'm not sure, because I'm studying uh, Beauvoir uh, in the master, and I just and I just uh, um, think sometimes, if you have something to say about it, that uh, in her memory, she is really um, anal analyzing her life, in a very not cold way, but uh, it's really interpretative. And uh, when we read her novels, like L'Invité, uh, we can really see the fact that she was also in the trio with Sartre and uh, old ladies, even uh, especially Olga, also really, I think, in my point of view, traumatically impacted by the um, these relationships with three people, especially because of the um, man regards of Sartre in uh, those uh, ladies. And she was at first her in really uh, an intellectu intellectual relationship with those girls. And I think, uh, and I'm not sure, but I'm wondering if you think that in her novels, which are less analyzed by uh, the, the studies, I think she express uh, real traumas not as uh, in her memories, which is more uh, for uh, other to explain uh, the life and what she's, think what she's thinking. But in her novels, I think we have this really um, relationship with uh, love and with uh, sexuality and with things that were more inside her and that she didn't uh, want it maybe to, to explain with her real name. So she expressed herself by characters like Françoise in the L'Invité. So I think I'm not, I don't know if we can defend her or something like that, but I think it's a really important for find l'invité. I think it's really important to really to understand more the the sorrow she has also in those relationships with Sart and young women. Yes, thank you. That's very interesting because working, yes. Because what you're saying, if I understood well, is that the novels are more autobiographical than the memoirs. Is that <laughs> okay? But in and um, maybe I agree. But on the other hand, um, uh, sh she hated the fact that uh, her readers um, or the critics um, tried to see her in her novels. So, but I agree that it is an, an interesting point of view, uh, and uh, and. I think that we can agree, uh, based on our conversation, that um, every writing, um, bio bio memoir, novel, correspondence, has this personal dimension, um, and so that that it can be interpreted through. 
um, the autobiographical um, writing, maybe. But I don't know if. But I think it's very interesting. Thank you. Yes. So the status of the novels in in philosophical discussions of Beauvoir is highly contested, um, and so I suppose it depends what we. What I, my skeptical mind says, well, what can we prove on the basis of a fictional text? Um, I think we can say about memoir that she was constrained by more than the conventions of the genre of, of memoir. She was also constrained by the law. So she could, you, the, the loi de la vie privée means that you cannot publish certain things about other people. For example, you cannot publish that you had homosexual relationships with them um, without poss possible legal repercussions. Um, so she wasn't necessarily hiding things out of deviousness. Um, she may have just been complying with the wishes of uh, the law or or with respect for the privacy of others. Um, but I do think that the fiction is telling. And if you look at what she wrote after L'Envité, uh, when she wrote Le Sang des Autres, the, the epigraph of Le Sang des Autres is from Dostoevsky. And it talks about the asymmetrical responsibility that it's, it's a quote from the brothers Karamaz Karamazov, that we are all responsible and I am more responsible than everyone. It's a paradoxical claim, um, but she's clearly uh, felt the weight of her responsibility. And that, that novel, I think, treats things very differently from L'Envité. Thank you. 